Today's ship chat is a request by Navark David Reeves. If you have a request for a ship chat, then you can join at the command tier and you will be able to make video requests. Thank you very much. Right, so today by request of Mr. Reeves, we're going to be looking at the Miranda class variants. Um, it needs very little explanation, but of course, um, we all know that throughout the years of Star Trek, the Miranda was used in many different episodes and in many different forms. And I've alluded to them previously in the previous Miranda ship chat, which was probably a long time ago now anyway. Um, but we'll go more in depth here and look at the different variants and what they actually do. Okay, so we'll just very quickly look at the behind the scenes of each of the, the the overall model, because most of it is the same model. So the original Miranda model was redressed a total of three times, and then two of the other variants are actually kit bashes, which were made for Deep Space Nine, for the Deep Space Nine fleet shots. Uh, so we'll, And that's the Ptolemy and the Antares. We'll get to them when we get to them. Um, the There was also a CG model that was created specifically for First Contact. So, we'll get into it. So, we'll start with, essentially, the the base model, I think, is the most sensible thing to start with. And our example here is the USS Landry from Next Generation. Um, essentially, what we have here is a stripped-down, naked Miranda. It's really quite disgusting, frankly. I just really have some decency and put some kind of modules on, you know. And just run around space like that. Um, but it's basically just used for simple cargo duties, maybe passenger ferries as well. Um, but it's a very simplified, stripped-down version of the, Mar of the Miranda class. This is probably how they leave the yards before they're being, before they're completely outfitted. They probably go to a separate yard to receive their modules. But they can. This is the part of the advantage of the Miranda class is that they can be chopped and changed. And this is just essentially what the basic Miranda is. Uh, not a bad ship in all things considered, but yeah, could certainly benefit from some additional uh, modules. So we'll get on to now the more commonly known, the most commonly known Miranda variant. And of course, that's the, we'll call it the Reliant, but it's the Armed Miranda. Uh, this is essentially the combat variant, and it is potent. Um, so as well as having six phaser batteries on the saucer, as per the 23rd century armament. It also has uh, two mega phasers on the pylons, which are extremely powerful weapons. Very, very powerful. Probably comparable to a Klingon heavy disruptor cannon, which would you'd only really see, in terms of contemporary ships, you'd probably only really see something that powerful being mounted on a D-10 or a D-6. Uh, most of the other Klingon ships use smaller uh, medium disruptors. It also then has a twin photon torpedo launcher. As previously discussed in the episode in the video concerning the Constitution refit, this has a lot of advantages in that the photon torpedo module is outboard from the rest of the ship because it means if it does take damage and is destroyed, you've got some distance between it and the rest of the ship. So it's a very good safety feature and it supplies the Miranda with an incredible amount of firepower. The fact that it's able to kind of rival a Constitution. I think it really does come down to... Um, the Constitution is probably overall tougher, but but this version of the Miranda is pr a pretty powerful ship for the 23rd century. Right, now we'll get on to another redress that appeared in Next Generation. That being the... USS Bozeman or Soyuz class. Now, it's funny because this ship is often referred to as a separate class. It's the Soyuz class. Um, there's no earthly reason why it should be a different class. Yes, there's an extension module on the back, you can see, um, but the rest of the hull is a Miranda hull. And given that, you know, roll bars and other modules are chopped and changed with no problem and no one thinks that it's a different class, I don't see why you would not also consider this a continuation of the Miranda class. 
it's just my opinion on that matter. Um, essentially what you have is a load of antenna. Now these are not weapons. As, as much as we may like, and as turreted and strange as they may look, these are not weapons, these are communications antennas. This is a communications cruiser. And you might think that this is very strange in a world in which you have subspace communications, but it's worth bearing in mind. You've got to bear in mind travel times and delays and also encryption. Uh, the Soyuz variant would be very, would basically follow behind a fleet and serve as its main communication relay, something that is mobile, can follow the fleet and thus also be protected by the fleet. Uh, and it was a vital part of the Federation's early warning system and general communication battle net during the Klingon Cold War. Uh, these ships would be instrumental in providing early warning against potential Klingon incursions and then also in coordinating and uh, massing the fleets together and getting organized to r repel the Klingons. The Soyuz class was essential to that as a communications cruiser. And uh, well, we don't see many since, but uh, certainly in its day, it was considered absolutely indispensable. Indispensable. Our next variant is the Saratoga variant, as per seen in the Battle of Wolf 359. Now, the Saratoga variant has these two large pods with these sort of deflector looking apparatuses on them. They sort of look like the old, um, the original Constitution deflector dish. Now, again, these are not weapons. Uh, these are likely subspace telescopes. So the idea of the Saratoga variant is that it is for deep space, long range uh, observation and charting. So essentially, without going to a planetary system, it can use these telescopes to zoom in on a distant system and, and get an actual look at what is there and what's going on and how many planets and that it can collect incredible amounts of scientific data uh, through the use of these long-range subspace telescopes. Now it does have it does have tactical implications as well because you can use this to peek into enemy space. So <laughs> there are probably plenty of instances in the 23rd century where the Klingons would see and view it with a lot of suspicion because they knew full well that that was probably being used to spy on them with its long-range telescopes. Not necessarily so useful in a pinch, but over that long Cold War period, as a, as a reconnaissance thing, as a means of knowing what the Klingons were doing and everything. And I'm sure the Klingons probably had something similar one way or another. So in terms of that, it probably helped reduce tensions because both sides actually knew what each other had. Create some clarity in the otherwise uh, murky situation of the Klingon Federation Cold War, and in that way may have been instrumental in averting war. We don't know, but potentially. That now brings us to the Antares variant. Now, this is a DS9 kit bash, and we never actually see it in its full form. It's one of the damaged ships of the fleet. So unlike the Soyuz and the Saratoga, the Antares actually keeps the mega phasers. Those remain on the pylons, but the pylons no longer connect to a torpedo launcher. Instead, mounted from a third pylon, is a very large wedge-shaped module. Uh, it looks like a large iron. It's very strange. Now, what this is, is essentially a broad sweep sensor module. This is just a overall generalized sensor package. Yes, so it's a broad sweep sensor module, which is just good for generalized scientific duties and the fact that it still has its mega phases it means it's probably actually a better bet to send out on scientific assignments and explorations particularly uh, very risky situations where you might not send an oberth um, it's certainly a significant step above an oberth and would be able to handle itself should anything go awry um, but essentially, its primary role is to just be a generalized science ship. Uh, now, this brings us to the last one, which I don't believe ever made it onto the screen, but it was a kit bash that was made. And I'm, I'm on two minds to 
call it a Miranda variant because it has a very different configuration. And this is the USS Bradford. Now, this is very similar to the Ptolemy class from FASA, which is a fuel transport. Again, you see it with the Bradford. It has two large cylinders carried underneath the hull, and the warp engines are instead placed on top of the hull. Now, you could say that actually it's fine because they're probably plugging the warp engines into the same into the same connection points as the uh, as the roll bars uh, on the other variants. So they're still connecting to the warp core. It just happens that they're up top and, and not down bottom. The real reason is, of course, because of the weight distribution on the model. And if you tried putting those things on the top of the model, they would probably those large cylinders on the top of the model, they'd probably snap off. So you need to have those on the bottom and put those engines on the top. But that's aside. I think it does count as a Miranda variant. But in any case, what is this thing then? The USS Bradford was very simply, it's a fuel transport and we see it in the Dominion War. Now we'd almost certainly see these in the 23rd century as well. And in fact, they're probably even more important in the 23rd century because uh, ships got through fuel much quicker, and it was much harder to come by than it is in the Dominion War. As an antimatter stockpile on almost every planet, uh, or every inhabited planet, uh, by the 24th century. So it's very easy to refuel your ship. As compared to in the 23rd century, where things are far less developed. And you may well, your whole fleet may be relying on these logistics and auxiliary ships to keep you supplied with fuel. In the Dominion War, it's just as important because, yes, okay, you can pick up fuel at every inhabited planet and the galaxy is pretty densely populated, but if you want to do any further kind of maneuvering, uh, having fuel carriers with you is pretty important because it gives you that extra bit of range that your enemy may not have accounted for. So that's, that's really, it gives you a little bit of wiggle room and flexibility to behave in a way that is unpredictable to your enemy. Um, so while it's not necessarily essential to fleet operations in the 24th century, it is a very useful asset in providing additional mobility to a fleet group. So that's why these fuel transports are still in use in the 24th century. Now that really covers all the, at least, canon Miranda variants. There are plenty of I'm sure there are plenty of non-canon, and if you have any suggestions of non-canon Miranda variants, uh, tell me in the comments below because I'd be very interested to see them. Um, but ultimately, this really demonstrates the versatility of the Miranda class and really how important it was to Starfleet, especially in the 23rd century. I mean, they, they were really onto a very good ship for that time, and I think Starfleet knew it. It was a solid platform, almost rivaling uh, the Constitution class it wasn't just a good combat vessel, uh, but it was also just very good for running the Federation on a day-to-day -day basis and running Starfleet and keeping it moving. Um, so, as I say, it was instrumental in the 23rd century and really was the workhorse of Starfleet into the 24th century and kept Starfleet moving that entire time. So it's really quite impressive. I really would do wish... Other classes that had since been created for the show got the same kind of treatment and the number of uh, variants. I know it's probably considered a little cheap, but it would add some nice a nice degree of um, realism and familiarity to the show. And uh, you give something new, but also something familiar. So just a suggestion, because I think uh, variety really is the spice of life.